Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. This, this is great. I guarantee you this is the nicest thing I will do today. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I just can't think of anything nicer than being um, with a group of people that think about trees all the time. Um, and uh, I'm not usually with those kind of people. Um, plus, there's a guitar in the background. So, you know, w w that's a sign of a great conference, <laughs> that there's a guitar here. Um, so I'm from the EPA. I work in the Office of Air and Radiation. I actually don't know much about water, so I'm not going to talk about water, um, <clears throat> except that I have a glass of it over there. But um, uh, I'm sure there are people here who are, are smarter than I am about that. I'm going to talk about, about air and in particular about uh, the Clean Air Act and, um, uh, and how, I, I guess I may be the most regulatory oriented person here on the program and I think that's what I can bring to you because there's nothing I can tell you about trees that you don't know already. Um, uh, to talk about how we think about these things on the regulatory side. And I think one of the things, one of the messages that's really important for me to convey is that we do think about trees on the regulatory side. So that's step number one, right? Um, uh, I have a background in state government, actually. Um, I worked, uh, worked for stu two states, um, and uh, the, the most recent state experience I had uh, was in the state of Indiana. I worked at the environmental um, agency there, and I was the air director. I was the head of the air office. And so I was the, the one largely responsible for figuring out how Indiana was going to address air quality problems in the areas of the state where air quality did not meet federal health standards. Um, so I've been in the position of a state regulator trying to figure out what am I, what are the smart, cost-effective, um, publicly acceptable, uh, if not desired, measures that we can put in place to reduce air emissions, um, improve public health, satisfy our legal obligations, and that's what, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, um, and, 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 and make our communities better for everybody. Um, and that's kind of challenging, and it's getting more challenging for states. So, uh, so this kind of conversation is, is really, really welcome. Um, I, I wanted to talk about two things. Um, uh, one is how can urban forestry programs, tree planting programs, be helpful for, for states and communities in complying with Clean Air Act requirements? Um, and then uh, uh, how can urban forestry uh, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions? Um, I'll probably spend more time on the first one of those because I think I have more to offer you there than in the second one. Um, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about what EPA is doing on the second one, because we, we do um, focus a lot on, on um, uh, various programs to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so um, without uh, telling you stuff that you've heard a bunch of times and don't need to be told, um, obviously trees are good for air quality. Right, trees are good for air quality. Um, uh, they they um, reduce um, ground level temperatures. They can reduce energy use, which um, results in, in less emissions. It can also reduce emissions in some um, interesting ways. You know, if you have trees, then you're not mowing lawns. You're you're um, reducing the emissions that are associated with those landscaping activities, as well as other. Um, uh, uh, pollutants that are associated with those kinds of activities. Um, one of my favorite ones is that if you keep cars cooler by parking them in the shade, you have fewer evaporative emissions from the vehicles while they're sitting out in the sun. That's a, actually a big contributor to air quality problems in our cities, is cars sitting around baking in the sun and, and, and having and off-gassing, basically. So if you put them under, under trees, they won't do that as much. Um, and there are a lot of, when you think about trees, there are a lot of ways you can think about tree planting programs that are, are even more suited towards reducing emissions. Um, so uh, planting lots of trees is better than planting not so many trees. Um, uh, uh, maintaining and sustaining existing tree cover is, is good. Um, large trees um, are, are very beneficial. Using trees that require low maintenance, again, getting back to uh, the maintenance activities themselves can uh, um, release emissions that, that you want to avoid. Um, and, and certain types of trees are better um, at dealing with certain kinds of pollutants than, than others. Um, so, so there are um, certain trees that are particularly good because they emit low levels of volatile organic compounds themselves. Um, I, I mentioned my, my favorite example of uh, uh, cars in the shade. Um, certain evergreen trees are particularly good at addressing particulate um, emissions. So there's all kinds of um, good and smart things to do. And I'm just thrilled that all the research is, is going on that you guys are engaged in because um, it's that kind of information that will make it possible for state and local regulators and planners to, to, to use these 
techniques. So how can these sorts of things be helpful to a state or a community thinking about its air quality? Um, I'll start with the easy one first. Um, in the last couple of years, EPA has launched two related initiatives. One is called Ozone Advance, and the other is called PM Advance. Um, so you, you know, I presume, that EPA issues um, health-based air quality standards for a variety of pollutants, and the two key urban ones that we worry about are ozone and particulate matter. These two programs are for areas that where air quality meets those standards. But they may be kind of close, or they may be expecting significant growth, or they may just be concerned that they want to make sure they maintain healthy air. These programs are um, designed to provide uh, partnership, assistance, resources, tools, without really any expectations, except that those communities are trying to do something good. So there, there's no timelines. There's no commitments they have to make. Uh, we give them no money, um, uh, but we give them help. And the idea is that they can use that program as a way of getting their local communities engaged in the clean air effort and in understanding the kinds of things in the community that lead to emissions of the kind of pollutants that cause ozone and PM problems, volatile organic compounds, nitrogen oxides, uh, particulate matter. So um, although there's no requirement, um, there's, there's a, a hope that those communities will find some things to do locally that will actually improve air quality. It might be an ozone action day program where they encourage people not to fuel their cars and th those sorts of traditional things. But how about a tree planting program? It could certainly be a tree planting program. And, and the thing about that is that since there are no legal requirements for this program, it is pre-obligation. Uh, um, nobody has to go through justifications. Nobody has to go through reviews or approvals or or quantifying or any of that. So um, I think that that's a, a really good um, entree for folks who are interested in partnering with communities to, um, to talk to them. Uh, there are 31 communities across the country that have signed up um, for Ozone Advance. The, the PM Advance announcement just went out recently um, when we finalized the new PM standard in December. Um, and we expect, uh, I, I hope, that, that some of those same communities will sign up for both. We expect we'll get some new ones as well. So, so I think that's a, a, a really promising area. Um, OK, so what about areas that are not meeting the air quality health standards? Um, I don't know how familiar uh, most of you are with the whole Clean Air Act mechanism. Uh, but what happens is that if a, we, just, we just revised the PM standard. So the steps that will happen is that the states will work with their own monitoring networks to figure out what parts of their state might not meet that new PM standard. And uh, we go through a process then working with the states, and we will formally designate certain areas across the country as being not in compliance with those standards. That starts uh, planning obligations for the state to come up with a plan where over a period of um, uh, five to six years, in the case of PM, they will um, put in place uh, enforceable mechanisms to reduce the emissions that are causing the high PM. So that's called the SIP, or the State Implementation Plan. And it's a fairly lengthy, arduous, um, and complicated process, um, as I think we would generally want it to be. We want states to be taking seriously the obligation to find the things that are contributing to the high pollution and put measures in place to, to stop them. Now, some of those measures will be things that EPA will pass, like national engine standards and fuel standards, uh, national rules for, for large industries. But there's a lot of room for states to um, to, to identify local and local ish, um, uh, measures to use, and that's why states are in charge of this, is because each community is different, and what's contributing to the, to the pollution in those areas is going to be different, and different measures will be appropriate. So could tree planting, urban forestry be part of uh, a, a state's plan for a city with, within its state? Well, maybe, um, but it would be challenging. Right now, it would be challenging, and, and, and I'll explain to you why. Um, the, the rules are that in order to be um, uh, counted in a SIP, um, a, a measure has to be quantifiable. You have to be able to figure out how much pollution it's going to reduce so that you can feed that into your model, which will tell you whether you've got enough in your plan to get to attainment in four or five years. Um, they have to be enforceable, uh, which means that you have to be able to, to, to count on them, and, and if the state 
or whoever's responsible for them doesn't do them, that means that you're not actually implementing your clean air plan. And so somebody has to be able to go and say, hey, you said you would do this. You need to do this. Um, they have to be surplus, which is that they have to be um, not already required. That's not really an issue um, uh, in this case. Um, um, and uh, there was one other one, which I'll remember in a minute. Um, but the, the key ones that I think are a focus for programs like, um, like this are uh, the quantification and the, um, oh, permanent, they have to be permanent, um, it, and the enforceability. And, th and those have been challenges. And I can tell you from my own experience as trying to do this uh, for the city of Indianapolis, say, or the city of South Bend, um, there, there are programs that you would like to be able to include because they make a lot of sense, but, but we could, just couldn't put the information together uh, that would satisfy EPA, um, that, that they were quantifiable, permanent, uh, federally enforceable, um, and all that sort of thing. So I know that, uh, that, and I think you guys have maybe already been talking about um, the work that's uh, going on to try to be able to better quantify the emissions reductions that um, result from tree planting programs. Um, at least I hope you have. Um, and if not, I, I would commend that to folks as an area that it would be very helpful um, to have better information on. Um, we have, um, and, and, and our folks um, work with some of our other federal partners on, on those issues and, um, and, and hope we certainly can continue to, to do that and maybe even step that up. Um, so uh, we've had, I, I asked folks um, in my office for um, the experiences that, that people have had that what, where communities have tried to do this. And there, there have been a few, um, Houston, Baltimore, Sacramento, um, and New York have gone down the road of um, uh, trying to include strategies for urban forestry in their state implementation plans. Um, to my knowledge, um, there has not yet been a, a state implementation plan that successfully included one of these programs. I think maybe Houston got the furthest and they just sort of got stuck on this, on this quantification issue. So um, now EPA, um, we recognize that, um, that, that we, need to, we need to encourage ourselves. Um, we don't need to encourage cities and people like you because you know the value of these programs. We need to encourage ourselves to find ways uh, to make these kinds of programs uh, workable in, in state implementation plans. For one thing, at this point, some cities have, ha have really done a lot of the cost effective um, and, and reasonable things. Uh, they've controlled their industries, um, cars are getting cleaner, um, they've done things like lawnmower buyback programs, they have good public education programs, they've, they've addressed uh, small businesses, and, and they're looking for opportunities, um, and particularly something like tree planting, which has so many benefits beyond the air quality benefit. I mean, it's just, it's just a winner. Um, people are lining up to, to do these sorts of programs. Um, so finding a way to, to, to um, make those workable in, in the Clean Air Act program is, is important. Um, we do have some efforts um, and have had for a while on trying to provide guidance to the states on how to uh, include these non-traditional programs. So we have, we have guidance um, on um, uh, uh, um, how to um, try to calculate and quantify things that, that don't really lend themselves to, to that sort of thing. We have a, a policy from 2004 um, that focuses on voluntary measures. That's been another challenge for, for people. How do you take credit in a regulatory document for a program that's voluntary? Um, and tree planting has that element to it, right? Because um, uh, you, you, um, they're, they're done by cities or towns, they, ne they need to be maintained, and those things are not usually put in place by law or regulation. Um, so so that's, that's a difference for us. Um, we also have um, a policy from 2005 that talks about states um, bundling measures, each of which uh, don't amount to much, maybe in the grand scheme of things. So uh, a tree planting program is not going to be as effective as uh, a clean car program or regulating your steel mills, um, for example. But if you put a bunch of these things together, um, then, then, then maybe they're workable. So, so we're trying to think about it that way. Um, we also recently issued guidance on um, uh, for how states can use um, energy efficiency and renewable energy programs, um, whether they're, they're state renewable energy portfolio standards or other kinds of programs, 
um, uh, to, to get credit in their state implementation plans. And, and it's a pretty elaborate um, document, but it lays out four different paths for states to use. So I think these are the kinds of, this is the kind of thinking that we can use um, when, when the, the science is there um, for us to talk about uh, programs like, like tree planting. So, so that, that's kind of the, the world of the Clean Air Act as it relates to these kinds of programs. I, I, as I said, I think that with our ozone and PM advanced programs um, and with, um, with some new areas uh, looking uh, for programs, uh, this, this would, it would be great to continue to work with you guys um, to encourage um, cities and, and towns and states to think about uh, this kind of a program as, as part of their SIP plan. Um, I was going to just talk for a minute because I only have about five more minutes left, I think, right? I don't want to, yeah, okay, um, uh, about, cl about climate change. Um, so uh, we're doing a lot of work um, to um, understand and try to quantify the, the benefits in terms of climate change that, that um, urban forestry um, can bring. And of course, it's, uh, a lot of it is related to um, that the energy that doesn't need to be uh, produced um, at your local power plant for, for heating and cooling as, as a result of, of the, those services that the trees um, provide um, uh, and the storage um, of carbon that, that, that the trees provide. Um, so, so those are important. Um, so we, um, we calculate that um, every year as part of our annual GHG greenhouse gas um, uh, inventory submission to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing how much urban trees um, can do um, for, for climate change. Um, in 2011, which is the most recent year, um, we calculated that urban trees um, stored um, uh, roughly uh, 69 million metric tons um, of, of carbon CO2 equivalent in their biomass. So that's, that's pretty significant um, and is an increase uh, since uh, 1990 um, from about 48 million metric tons. So, um, uh, so, so that's, that's good to see that um, increasing. Um, and uh, so um, it, it, in terms of providing one of another set of tools um, for uh, looking at ways to mitigate uh, carbon in, in our atmosphere, um, uh, we certainly encourage urban forestry um, for that. Um, we also um, are working on um, uh, uh, urban heat island um, issues um, and have some, some information available on our website. Um, these are, as, as we give advice to people about uh, things that they can do in terms of adaptation and, uh, and, and uh, climate mitigation, and many cities are, are interested in that and committed, committed to doing it. Um, we try to provide uh, information about uh, through our heat island um, program. Um, and again, you know, it's the same um, benefits that, that I've already talked about, um, but in, in terms of the, the temperature improvement, um, it, it's, it's tremendous that, that you can get from, from planting trees. So, um, so I, I, won't, I won't go over all the, that information again because we kind of talked about it already. Um, and, and it has the other benefits um, the, of the, in the media that I'm not going to talk about very much, which is stormwater management and, 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 and things like that. Um, so um, I, I, I think I'll probably stop there and, um, and hope that there will be um, time for questions. Um, we, we do think on the, um, in the air world that, um, that there is very much a place for urban forestry. Um, uh, we have some challenges in our, in our regulatory structures that we need to, to deal with, but, um, but the, the, this EPA is, is really committed to figuring out how to encourage innovative, um, and, and, and new and, and multi-benefit um, uh, programs to satisfy Clean Air Act requirements, um, bring those public health benefits, but also um, uh, bring so many more people to the table um, through programs like urban forestry. So again, thank you for having me.